privilege to be here with you today. We are glad to be able to come and encourage and share with you the Word of God. Uh, my wife Diane and I have been in ministry now since the, well, started in Bible College in 81. And uh, so over 40 years, we've been blessed to have opportunity to, to minister in uh, several different churches. Um, just a little background on us so you can get, get to know us a little bit. Uh, we've lived downstate in Michigan the majority of our lives, except for the four years of Bible College down in Florida. Um, and, and by the way, after I got done with four years, I knew it was time to go back up to God's country and leave Florida to do itself. Um, we, we do appreciate living here in, in the north. And uh, uh, we've uh, been in three different churches since Bible College. Um, first one was a, an associate or uh, assistant pastor, and I needed a couple of years to, to learn a little bit more of the practical and not just the, the book learning, you might say. Uh, and then after that, we were in Powas, Michigan, which is over on the east side of the state, and we were there for almost seven years. And then our last pastorate and longest pastorate was in a little town called Remus, which is between Mount Pleasant and Big Rapids, and uh, we were there for about 30 years. And just really uh, appreciated that. Uh, uh, had a great time there. Wonderful folks. Uh, we really were blessed by being a part of that uh, congregation. Uh, but we knew it was time to retire. And about five years ago, we started uh, looking for what God would have us to do, where he'd have us to go. And we found a little place in Wakefield. And uh, we started building, and that was uh, about five years ago. We, we actually moved into the house last fall. And so it took us a while to get it built, but God provided, and we were blessed in that. And, and so we've been up here now since uh, a year ago, May, beginning of May, just in time for the flood there in, in, uh, in Wakefield, and uh, so we've been, we've been blessed by that. We go to Calvary Baptist there in Wakefield, and are uh, kind of a, uh, it's a whole different role now, because now, for the first time in my life, I'm a deacon at the church there, and uh, that, that's a little strange. My wife is the treasurer. And so we do have some responsibilities there, and, and we try to take those seriously and, and uh, be a part there as well. But uh, I have been looking forward to the opportunity to, to fill pulpit and uh, minister to some. Uh, unfortunately, it's in this situation where you've lost your pastor, and I feel so bad about that. Uh, but, you know, God is in control, and he knows and uh, he is going to be there for you every step of the way and provide for you uh, every step of the way. And so you continue to be faithful and continue to serve him, and, and he, he's going to bless. I know he is. Well, the, the opportunity today, I just thought what we would do is uh, go through a couple of topical messages to begin with. So this week and next week will be topical. Uh, we'll just see how the Lord provides and what he what he leads uh, thereafter if there is any opportunity. But before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we come before you looking forward to the privilege it is to look into your word, to be edified by it and through it, to be challenged in it, but Father, also for you to be glorified. So Father, we pray that in all of this, each of us would have a heart open and receptive to your ministry and your spirit. Father, that you would guide us and direct us as individuals, but also as a body of believers here in this place. Father, we thank you for your word and the challenge we will have in it. We pray this in thy name. Amen. If you would, just go ahead and turn with me to the uh, book of John. Now, uh, I... I'm just doing topical. I, I realize that uh, he's going to be doing a series in, in John, it sounds like, and I didn't want to step on any toes, but uh, John chapter 20. Now, don't, don't you love reminders? You know what? Diane and I have all of a sudden found the need for reminders. 
Matter of fact, we make reminders about everything, and then we got to try to remember where we put our reminders. Uh huh. And, and and you know, pardon. Welcome to the club. It, it is very very true. But reminders are good. And the Word of God gives us many, many, many reminders. You know, that's one of the blessings about being a, a believer for a number of years is that, you know, the Word is true from cover to cover, but there's nothing new under the sun in it. And by the way, if somebody comes and tells you that, you know what, I've got some new truth, I've got something that you've never heard before, you better really watch out because he could be feeding you a line that you uh, don't want to eat. Okay, so uh, be careful of that. But the Word of God has got many, many reminders that we as believers need in our lives daily. Well, our world is certainly a difficult place, isn't it? It is a place that has seemingly lost its way, its sense of direction, you might say. The unrest, unrest in our country, politically and socially, Wars across the world, our economy is in shambles. Uncertainty about what's next has unfortunately gripped the hearts of many people. Now, I'm not going to in any way, shape, or form deny the reality that things are tough out there. Because they are. But you know what? No matter how tough things get, we have the Word of God and the promises of God to draw us and bring us through any time that we may face. Of course, this isn't the first time in history, is it? Times have been bad all throughout history. I remember the 67, 68 race riots in Detroit. As a child, I lived through those days in that city. That was awful. Matter of fact, I've never, I mean, I've been concerned about my safety a number of times in my life. But I remember one summer, Dad had us sleep in the basement all summer. Years later, I, I asked Dad, Dad, why did you do that? He said, bullets can't go into the basement. We lived in an area of Detroit that was... Uh, let's just say, very difficult during those days. Times have been tough many times in human history. But you know, for believers, times are especially tough when we realize that God, who is our Savior and our Lord, sometimes seemingly, from a human perspective, is distant. In John chapter 20, you know the surrounding events, obviously, because it is the crucifixion and then the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. John chapter 20, and beginning just in verse 19, then the same day at evening, the begin, it being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus, and stood in their midst, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Now, what were the disciples going through? Well, obviously, one of the most traumatic events in their personal lives. The person that they had put their complete trust in, the one that they had called teacher and master and Lord, the one that they had con were absolutely convinced in that was going to be Messiah Christ, they had established the kingdom on earth had been crucified. They had buried him and put him in the tomb. Their world literally, seemingly, had fallen apart. And they were now in hiding. They were gathered together for fear of the Jews. The persecution that they feared would come upon them would be the same fate that they had seen their Lord go through. They were fearing for their lives. Times were hard. It was a, a period of life where they didn't know what was next. 
and Jesus came into the room. Miraculously, by the way, appeared to them, and his message was a message, a reminder that each one of us even needs today. Peace be with you. Peace. You know, the one thing that we all need in this life is not a different political system. It is not even a better economy. The one thing that we all need is Jesus' peace. So we can go through the storms of life, but we can face whatever the world may bring. So we can be faithful and, and, and consistent walking with Jesus day by day by day, not allowing the world to shake us. See, fear is a terrible thing. And each one of us probably have apprehensions and even some fears about the world around us today. But wouldn't it be great if, if Jesus would appear through those doors right now and stand in our midst and say what? Peace be with you. I'm going to say something that might seem on the surface as glib or as, as unrealistic. But guess what? Jesus is here today, and he's saying peace. Because God's intention for his children is that we would live a life of peace with him. Peace knowing that no matter what may befall us, we are in his hands, that we are under his control, and that he has never left us or forsaken us. He has never departed and said, you're on your own, guys, because we're never on our own. As believers in Jesus Christ, we are always in his presence. And we are always in his care. We are those of God's elect who know that we have Jesus Christ always. God's answer to fear in the world is really an understanding that he is in control. By the way, it's probably a good thing to make a distinction between fear that paralyzes and a healthy respect for danger. Ah, I have a healthy respect for danger. Now, I've not always been the smartest tool in the box. And I put myself into some situations that, frankly, were pretty, pretty dangerous. But you know what? I, I do have a healthy respect for things that are dangerous. And it's, I think it's growing as I get older. I, I do. I think I'm learning a little bit. You know, I, I, I live at the end of a dirt road now, at the end of a very, very small, what used to be a two-track. So the county came in and widened it and put a full road in there for us. I don't know why. We're the only ones at the end of it there, but they did. So we don't get much traffic at all. And we've been up here just long enough, I think, to understand and to to feel good about less traffic. And we went down to Grand Rapids to see our kids. We have three kids. They all live in the Grand Rapids area of Michigan. And, you know, that place is nuts. It never used to be so nuts, but now it's worse. And I mean with traffic. We're on 131. There's a place on 131. It's four lanes, and you're going through an S curb, they call it. And, you know, we're just driving through, going to the kid's house, and all of a sudden, man, I've got semi-trucks on both sides of me. And and, and, I, and the, I guess it used to never bother me, but all of a sudden it's like, you know, I'm not comfortable with this. I'm driving along, and these guys are a whole lot bigger than I am, and I'm in a pickup truck, but still they're just flying along. And I'm like, you know, I'm backing off here just a little bit. I'll let them go. 
Now, I don't know that that's fear, but that is a healthy respect for that which is potential danger. That's not what we're talking about here. You see, what had happened to the disciples after the Lord's crucifixion was that they, they were paralyzed by their fear. They were incapacitated. They were no longer doing what Jesus had instructed them to do, what he had given them to do, but rather what were they doing? They were there gathered together hiding for fear of the Jews. You see, fear that is unhealthy is a fear that paralyzes us, that keeps us from doing the will of God. And none of us need to have that fear. Because our Savior should give us the peace that we need to live life no matter what. The promise of God that we can totally take absolute dependence upon is the promise that we have eternal life because He has eternal life. You know, the resurrection of Jesus was not only a miraculous and wonderful event, but it was an event that was absolutely essential for us to have the guarantee of eternal life in. Because he rose, we too will rise. In that great resurrection chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we read these words in verse 55. O death, where is thy sting, O grave? Where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. What's the worst thing that could happen to you in this life that you might have a fear about? They could kill you. You could die. Is that really the worst thing? Is that really so bad in the end? You know what, as a believer in Jesus Christ, they can kill the body, but they can't have the soul. You know what, this life will end one day, but my life will never end. Because in Jesus Christ, I have the promise, the guarantee, that because my Savior rose, and because He lives, and because now I am in him, I too will live. And my life will be in eternity with him. Now, I love this place. I love earth. I love this life. I love my wife. I, I love all that I'm involved in and the people around me, my kids. I, I love to be out in the woods. There's nothing I enjoy more than just being outside. But you know what? I've been studying the Bible a long time. And there's one place that I can honestly tell you that I'm looking forward to seeing yet. But it's not on this planet. It's in heaven. Have you ever taken time to, to really read through some of the events that are happening in the book of Revelation? In the descriptions that John is trying to give us of what he is seeing physically and how he's using such eloquent and beautiful language trying to describe for us that which is truly, humanly at least, incomprehensible and indescribable. What will heaven be like? I don't know exactly, but I know this. It's going to be great. And so when I leave this earth, whether it be in what I would consider my timing or not, it is certainly going to be the better option for me. And heaven awaiting each and every one of us is the promise that we have that no matter what happens on this earth, we should never tie ourselves so closely to it that we don't rather prefer and look forward to what God has promised each of us, which is heaven itself. You know, the promise that we've been given of heaven is rooted in the authority of God himself and premised on the fact that Jesus Christ bodily rose from the grave. I used to think that Christmas was my favorite holiday. 
favorite time of the whole year. Well, you know what? I've changed over the years. I, re I mean, Christmas is wonderful. Don't get me wrong. But by the way, after you've preached about 40 Christmas series, you kind of been there, done that. Well, the one event on the calendar that I think is even more special to believers is Resurrection Sunday. And I, I've called it that for years and years and years. And I know some people call it Easter today. That's okay. I understand that. But you know what? It's Resurrection Day. And I, I can't look forward to enough to Resurrection Day each year. The day where we celebrate the resurrection of our Savior is so special because it is also the day that we celebrate the reality of our promised resurrection. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For in Adam all die, even so in Christ, shall all be made alive. The promise that we have of eternal life is rooted and promised, rooted and grounded, excuse me, in the promise of God himself and the authority that he has. You see, there is no greater in the world, there is no greater in creation than God who is the creator. And because of that, his word is truth. His word is all there is. Now our world has gone crazy with relativism and everybody that does that which is right in his own eyes and quite honestly has convinced themselves that they are right. Have you ever been trying to discuss something with somebody who, and you have biblical basis for your argument, for your position, and you say, thus saith the Lord, and they say, well, that's not how I see it. Well, my friend, I hate to tell them this, but they're just plumb wrong. But they think they're speaking with authority. What authority are they speaking with? The authority they place in themselves. I, I I just got one thing to say about that. I've been wrong a lot in my life. And I'm guaranteeing them that they have been too, but I know one who's never been wrong. And what he says is truth. And so it doesn't really matter what we think. It doesn't really matter how we feel. It doesn't really matter what we want. If it is against the expressed written word of God, it's wrong. And that's just how it is. Uh, I guess you could say I don't have a lot of time and patience for opinions. I've said this for years, you know, opinions are like belly buttons. Everybody's got one and they're useless. Well, that's the way the world's opinions are contrary to the word of God. And we as believers, though, can understand that and accept that and actually relish in that because that means that what God has said to us, we know as truth. And God, my friend, has said that he'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Now, applying that to our daily lives, is that those things that most often give us consternation, those things which most often give us headaches, those things which must, uh, most often give us even fear, paralyzing fear in our lives, stopping us from doing the will of God, we know God is in charge, that he's in control. Not long ago, I had a little health scare, a little health issue come up. And, uh, you, you know, when the doctors tell you, hey, this could happen and you won't even have time to get to the hospital. You'll be dead. 
kind of makes you say, oh, okay. But it also puts you back a little bit and says, well, am I okay with that? And you know what? I can honestly say that except for the fact that I would leave my wife and, you know, uh, miss things here on earth, you might say, I was okay with that. I can say I'm in God's hands. I'm in his control. And when he decides it's time to gather me home, I'll go. Not because I'm willing necessarily, but because I am ready in his plan, that means, to go. God's answer to fear, then, is to trust him, trust the very fact that he is in control and that he is never, in spite of the circumstances which might seem so, failed to keep his word. He has never failed to keep his word. The basic problem that man has, you see, is no hope. Mankind without God faces an existence of no hope. The world has no hope. Eternity is just a dream for many. And because of this, they strive for the day in which they live, seeking to find peace in acquiring possessions, status, or control, yet all the time leaving their soul empty and lost. I honestly do feel bad for the world around us who's placing their hope in themselves. I feel bad because they are the ones who are going to be found wanting and lacking at the day of judgment. I feel bad for the individual who, who puts his hand in the air and says, I will have it my way. For many of us, we live through what I call the Burger King mentality. You know, have it your way. And the reality is, is that none of us can have it our way and really be satisfied with it. For in the end, what we think we want and how we want it is going to leave us lost and hopeless. Ephesians 2.12 says this, And at that time you were without Christ, being, being aliens to the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Our world lives with no hope. It's a sad place to be. How awful would it be to walk out these doors with no hope? and face the reality that any moment your life could be snuffed out, you could be gone in an instant and not know where you're going to go, not have any confidence or assurance. I have a, I have a brother, an older brother, who lives that way. His hope is in what he would consider to be a, a uh, um, universal consciousness that all is good and that all men are good. And ultimately, we're all part of the same cosmic awareness. Now, what that means exactly, I don't know. But my friend, to have your whole life staked in something so nebulous and undefined would be a horrible place to live. You know what? I can say with confidence, my hope is in the Lord. I know where I am going to go because I put my faith and trust in Christ. It is not on my terms, it is on God's terms. And I'm okay with that. What a good place it is for us to live, knowing that we are in the center of God's will, doing what he would have us to do. Not depending on ourselves. Not trusting in our own. Not left to our own devices but rather being able to have the confidence that he is in control. Mankind's basic prob problem, as I have said, is no hope. It's emblematic even of the disciples left to themselves. 
not only were they in the room hiding, but prior to that, in Matthew 27, we, we let, let me just read a couple of verses here. And when Joseph had taken the body, wrapped in a clean linen cloth, and laid it in a, in a new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock, he rolled a great stone over the door of the sepulcher and departed. And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher. Well, you know what that was a symbol of? The sitting against the sepulcher was really a sense of hopelessness or lostness. Now what do we do? We're going to sit here over against the grave of Jesus. What do we do? And while we would never say that we want to live like the world lives or think like the world thinks, sometimes even us as believers lose sight of the hope that we have in Jesus and become discouraged and despondent and sit against the sepulcher. Now what do we do? I, I want to encourage you folks. I really, really do. That anything and everything that happens in this life, God is in control of. He's never lost sight of you, ever, ever, ever. And while you may be tempted to sit against the sepulcher and say, now what? Understand that God is working. God has a plan, and in his plan, you are a part. And he's never lost sight. Don't lose hope. Don't lose hope. Trust God. He will provide. He will provide for you every step of the way. Jesus rose from the grave to give hope to the hopeless. And that, of course, especially applies for those who are without Christ. For each and every individual who realizes their hopelessness in this life, that they don't have eternal life guaranteed. It is only by faith in Jesus Christ that we gain eternity. It is only by putting our faith and trust in him that we have eternal life. They, they need to hear there is a hope. And it's not in this world. And it's not in ourselves. It's in Jesus. And anybody who puts their faith and trust in Jesus can have that eternal life, can have that eternal hope, and needs that eternal hope. And friend, we should be the lighthouse in this place, communicating that out to the world around us. But we can't just say it with our mouths. We have to demonstrate it with our actions, showing that we have hope in this world, that we have hope in this life. I truly hope, my friend, that you are a believer in Jesus Christ first and foremost. But not only that you are a believer in Jesus, that you are a believer who recognizes and acts on the hope that you have in this life. That you live differently than the world around you. That you're not caught in despair and despondency. That you don't just throw up your hands or, or try to rule this world but rather put your faith and trust in Jesus on a daily basis, knowing that he is there for you no matter what this world may bring. Now, I know it's difficult. I know the things around us drive us crazy at times, seeing the immorality of this world. I, 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 I get it completely. I understand the frustration of that. But you know what? In the midst of the frustration, in the midst of the, de of the despondency of why isn't this different? Why can't the world be different than what it is? It should be the reality that God is still in control. And I need to live for him. I need to be faithful to him. I need to believe him. And that will change how I act. It'll change how I live. It'll change how the world sees me. I'm not this angry Christian. What's our admonition? To live lovingly. That's how we're to live, folks. 
not with our fist in the air, not saying, I'm going to change this world. You know, not saying, well, I won't go into that. You know, you know I, it's difficult because I want to give you so many illustrations of, of things that I've seen in, in different scenarios, different things that have gone on. But let me just share with you one thing. I, there was a pastor once who learned that he had a very sharp wit and a very sharp tongue. And after going to Bible college and, and learning all kinds of things about the Bible and, and what God wants, he, he learned to address those things caustically. I used to say that he could slice and dice somebody up with the Word of God. And you can do that. You really can. You can share this word and the truth of it in a manner that's almost hard to hear. And then that pastor came across a verse in the book of Ephesians. It changed his ministry. It was, a, it was Ephesians chapter 4. Speak the truth in love. Hmm. That pastor was me. I began to realize I really needed to share this truth in the most loving way I could. Because God is love, and he wants us to love one another. Now, I'm not going to try to bypass any of the truth of Scripture. I'm not going to change the truth of Scripture. I'm not going to do anything to it. I'm going to share it just as it's given. But I need to do it in love. And you know what? Each one of us needs to share the faith that we have in God himself. The confidence that we have in this life, in love. Because we're no better than anybody in the world around us. You know that? Your neighbor might be the, the most uh, immoral person you can imagine. Maybe, maybe they're fighting against God continually. Are they any worse than you were? You know why? Because you face the same condemnation of sin that they face. But by God's grace, you've seen the light. By God's grace, you've trusted Christ as your Savior. By God's grace, you've been redeemed. Praise God for that. Now they need it. They need what you have. Because they're living this life with no hope. You have hope. Share the hope that's within you. And share it in a loving way, an encouraging way, a way that says, you know what? God loves you. Yeah, he hates your sin. That's absolutely true. He hates mine too. But he loves you. I, I really wanted to share a word of encouragement. Because sometimes we put our focus only on this life and the things of it. And the circumstances of this life so often make us see that God is out of control somehow. Or that he's forgotten us. My friend, he's not. He's never forgotten us. He's faithful to the end. And he wants us to live in hope, not in fear. Because fear paralyzes us from doing the will of God. Hope frees us to please him with our lives. Friends, I hope that that's your desire today as well. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, 
Thank you for your word. The absolute truth that it is. Father, thank you for our Savior, Jesus, who gives each of us who know him as our Lord confidence, hope, hope not only for tomorrow, but hope for today to know that you are in control. Help us, Father, to communicate that hope to the world around us in a way that is loving and sincere. Not ever thinking ourselves to have deserved anything from your hand, but rather for, through your grace, receiving the hope that we have and now wanting to share that with the world around us. Father, I just pray that you would bless and encourage each believer here today that you've never forgotten them, that you are there for them, that you are truly in control. We ask these things in our Savior's precious name. Amen.